Hey, thanks for tuning into the Long Great Lesson Show. It's a podcast that motivates and inspires leaders to pursue their passions and to leave a positive impact in their communities. Welcome back to another episode of Long Gray Lessons. I'm Tom Lay, and today I have Major Chevy Cook with me. Chevy graduated from the United States Military Academy at West Point in 2004 and served as an air defense artillery officer for his first few years at the 82nd Airborne Division at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. He then later branched psychological operations. In 2013, he would return to West Point as a tactical officer for Company D4 while simultaneously serving as an instructor in the Behavioral Sciences and Leadership Department. During his career, he's deployed to Iraq three times, Qatar twice, Niger, Jordan, Afghanistan, Bahrain, Kuwait, Tajikistan, and the United Arab Emirates. Today, Chevy is pursuing his PhD in Child Studies and Human Development with a focus on character development at Tufts University's Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. He's a Bronze Star recipient, the author of multiple publications, keynote speaker, father to two daughters, husband, and executive director and co-founder for MilitaryMentors.org. Like a true renaissance man, Chevy, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Tom. How are you doing today? Always good. I I have a little joke about that. Uh, since I have kids, I don't have time for bad days, uh, <laughs> so I'm always doing good. Very good, very good. And what brings you to West Point today? I'm actually doing like I did when I was here before, kind of dual hatting. So I'm actually doing qualitative research today. Okay. So I'm up with my research team from Tufts, diving into character development and talking with cadets all day. Also some staff and faculty about their perspectives about the military and physical pillars here mm -hmm. and how crucible experiences or developmental experiences help them gain character. Well, we're definitely going to dive deeper into those studies. So how does it feel to be back in an academic environment after being an operational unit for, for all these years? It feels great. So I, I, I joke sometimes also with my wife about, I feel like I'm stealing a little bit, right? Like it's so good to sit on my front porch and watch my kids roll around in the leaves or like now in the snow um, during some of the time that I have off to reflect and do some of my work. Um, but it also is very stretching, right? Mm -hmm. This is a different type of stretch than being a company commander or an S3 or just kind of at the grind. That's a stretch too, but this is, you know, intellectual stretch, a developmental stretch in just a different way. Mm -hmm. um, so it feels good. You know, it's, it's like um, when you try CrossFit or a different type of workout sure. um, and it, you know, you get a little bit sore, but you're like, I'm growing from this. That's how it really feels to be in academia right now. And, and how many years left do you have in this program? So I'm the mid of my second year. The Army gives you three years. So I have about a year and a half left. Okay. One more semester of classes. Only one class next semester. Shh, don't, don't tell anybody. <laughs> uh, and then the full last year will be focused on writing, uh, completing a dissertation, trying to make sure it's done on time. Um, on my timeline of finishing it in three years. Absolutely. Uh, so I can go back to the Operational Army or come straight back here to West Point. Okay. So I guess before we get to to that part, um, let's let's kind of rewind the clock a little bit okay. and let, let's start from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your childhood and your upbringing. OK, so um, I claim South Carolina, but it, that the story starts for me in Florida. I was born in Tampa, Florida. Um, I had two parents. Uh, mixed, I'm a mixed race uh, individual. The two of them, uh, one white, one black. They met on the competitive dance circuit, honestly. Um, they were in the disco and all that stuff. And wasn't dancing with the stars, right? No, no, no. This was way before. This was the 70s, right? So they um, they were just having a good time with each other at first as dance partners, and then it blossomed into something else. Um, and then along came myself uh, and eventually my younger brother, who's also in the Army right now. Um, but because of, you know, different life circumstances, um, their waltz or their disco dance, you know, came to an end. Mm -hmm. um, and we split ways. We all split ways. And uh, due to some other unfortunate circ uh, uh, circumstances, we uh, parted from my mom, living with dad. Dad had to move us to a sister, an aunt, and that aunt lived in South Carolina. So here I moved to South Carolina, never had even visited 
Didn't really know this aunt. We moved in there. Uh, low SES neighborhood, um, uh, socioeconomic status for, for those that aren't familiar with the terminology. And it was your typical 80s African-American neighborhood. Uh, very cliche uh, as far as uh, drugs and other things going on uh, in the neighborhood. I'm living with a bunch of older cousins. They're doing some um, questionable activities sometimes as well. And that environment wasn't tenable mm -hmm. as well. But I had a next door neighbor. Uh, we knew her as Sunkissed at the time, um, who we would go up the street and like borrow sugar from and borrow other things from, loaf of bread, milk. And eventually, after a couple of years, um, she actually asked if we wanted to live with her. Um, so obviously, you know, we said, yeah. And, you know, at first it was a weekend and then it was a week and then it was a month and then we just stayed. Um, and that lady today is my mother. Um, we call her Mama J. Everybody calls her Mama J. Mm -hmm. um, and she still lives in the same house. And when I go home to visit South Carolina, I still stay in the same house on the same street. Uh, in that same neighborhood. Um, so that's that was kind of my, my beginning, and we can dig into any details therein if you want to. But uh, Mama J today, my mom, is a, a person that was at once my uh, next-door neighbor. Wow. And so I guess kind of just like, one, that's, that's a very um, devastating thing for a, a child to go through, mm -hmm. which is like multiple different homes. Mm -hmm. And to not only like, lose one parent in the process, but mm -hmm. two, mm -hmm. and also an aunt, mm -hmm. right? And so how how did you and your brother kind of like thrive and blossom in that kind of environment? Yeah, I have no clue. Uh, I have little pieces and ideas of, of why we did. Um, you know, when you're a kid and those circumstances just happen, you don't really know any better, right? Like, you know, you don't really have the ability to see yourself from a third person perspective. And if you're if you don't have fellow friends or, or other little siblings or cousins that are going through the same thing, you you have no clue about the perspective. So honestly, up front, it was just we're just doing mm -hmm. right. So, for example, um, when we were going to leave my dad and leave Florida, we had just moved in with his brother to this this what we thought was a nice house. Didn't have anything in it. Uh, but a, a few beds and some things. And I remember very vividly playing about, you know, playing in the house, this big empty house, and it's new and it's for us and it's great. Um, and then, I, you know, we go to sleep. We wake up the next morning. I'm actually at my grandma's and my aunt is there. And we're like, well, wait, what is, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. and they're like, actually, we have all your stuff packed in the car. You're going to South Carolina. I'm like, well, where's my dad? he's got to go off to uh, prison so you, you can't be with him. And there's no such thing as, well, let me go get my own car because you know, I'm super young. You know, you, there's nothing you can do but get it, cry, get in the car, and go. Um, so we just kind of learned to go with the flow uh, in that early tumult. Um, and, you know, when we got to South Carolina and, and things were happening and, you know, some of my cousins are doing the best things in the neighborhood, um, moving drugs and stuff like that. You just don't know any better. So if they stick a pack in your backpack and say stop by that house on the way to the bus stop, you just kind of do it mm -hmm. without knowing. But you just kind of do. And then eventually you get some awareness, right? But that awareness usually comes from an impactful person. So when we finally get with Mama J, I'm a religious person. I don't want to make this religious, but I do think she's the embodiment of what would be an angel from maybe a higher power, mm -hmm. she started giving us a different perspective and a different outlook and started saying, hey, you don't have to be like other people in the neighborhood. You can get out of this situation. I haven't been to college, but you can, and you need to focus on that. That's how you're gonna get away from this. And then she you know, involved us in stuff like sports and believed in us in school and fostered those little talents and took on multiple jobs so she could have the money to do all of that stuff to provide us a better environment. And through that, we started to, I guess, thrive. Um, and then the kind of rest maybe is a little bit of history. Yeah. 
you also mentioned that um, there was someone that was a, a male figure mm-hmm. that, that played a significant role yeah. in your life. What, who was that and what mm-hmm. was the significance of that, mm-hmm. that connection? So growing up without a father directly in the home and, and Mama J, I mean, she never remarried. Uh, she was dating a guy at the time and he said, it's me or the kids. They got in an argument. It's me or the kids. And uh, she was like, she just walked back to the back room, start packing this stuff up and was like, okay, bye. Uh, so she never was with anybody else. So I, I was definitely seeking out mm-hmm. uh, male role models. When I was a fifth grader, a gentleman by the name of Corey Roberts had just graduated from University of South Carolina. So he's a young guy. He's also black. So he looks like me. He's in front of the classroom. And uh, I was a, a decent student, um, but I was a knucklehead. Right. And you can blame that on my life circumstances. Uh, but I like to blame it on myself because I'm pretty critical. <laughs> um but I was a class, you know, a class clown and all of that stuff. And one day he didn't allow me to go to recess. He also had a teacher's assistant at the time who was a college student. His name's Keith Burton. Mm-hmm. The two of them sit me down, can't go to recess. And I'm in there, you know, frustrated. And uh, Corey says, hey, um, where do you want to be in five years? And I literally did like this. I'm 11. 12, you know, being silly. So I said, yeah, I'll be 16. I'll be in high school. And then him and Corey kind of bounced all these really rapid fire questions off of me really quickly. What high school do you want to go to? Where is it in town? Are you What classes are you going to take? Are you going to be preparing for college? Are you going to play any sports? How are you going to get the practice? Are you going to work? Um, how are you going to get the work? How are you going to pay for gas money, insurance? All of these rapid fire questions. And I was like, you know, it was it was a lot. Um, and he said, I want to illustrate something to you, Chevy. You got all of this talent and all of this potential. And you're doing very well in school. At the time, I had won an art competition for the state, met the governor, got free flight lessons out of it. He says, you you know, meeting with the governor of the state. But here you are in my classroom. A disciplinary problem. Um, a class clown getting in fights with folks. If you took all that negative energy and matched it to your potential and started thinking about your life in five year chunks and about those goals and thinking about the steps therein that go with it, you could probably be something one day and stop being so silly and really be a smart guy. And that was a definite change. It was a switch in my life. One, it was a black man telling me that, that believed in me, that didn't focus on the negative, but said, hey, just a little shift and you're good to go. And two, he took the time to do that. Because a lot of times, you know, there are influential people out there that see that stuff, mm-hmm. but they have their own kids or their own things. Uh, or they're like, you know, I got so many other kids in the classroom or on the team if I'm a coach. But he took the time to say, no, I need to have this conversation. And this conversation couldn't have been more than eight or 10 minutes, but it changed the trajectory of my life. I told him that story. I caught up with Corey Roberts when uh, when I was a young lieutenant. I told him that story and he was crying because he he didn't know it had that impact. And um, me and Keith Burton still talk. Um, he, he He's a Facebook friend and, and we interface with each other to this day. I guess from that point on, um, are things starting to trend positive? Are, are you starting to move in the trajectory of, hey, I, I'm, I'm focused now? Where did your, where did your sights align? What, what happened from there? Yeah, so, so once he gave me that talk, um, my context didn't change, right? I stayed in the same neighborhood, mm-hmm. still was around the same stuff. Um, matter of fact, the first time I saw a dead body was actually at the end of my yard from a shootout. Um, and it was kind of boys in the hood that's like, you want to go see a dead body? You know, it was down the street for me. It wasn't in the streets of Iraq. It was in my neighborhood. Um, so I still had those contexts. But, he, you know, he made that point and uh, a very fortuitous thing happened where I tested for a program, a math program called MEGS, mm-hmm. M-E-G-S-S-S, Mathematics Education for the Gifted Secondary School Student. It used to be like a NASA prep program or an early STEM program for folks. Um, and that, and I passed this test and was able to 
go to school across town. So I didn't go to the zoned middle school I was supposed to go to. I went to sixth grade at Creighton Middle across town, took a bus for two hours every morning, catch the bus at five o'clock in the morning as a young 12 year old. We're talking like city bus, right? Oh no, we're talking about a school School bus. School bus is coming two hours. Two hours and it picked it with like this big ring route for all these meg students. Wow. um, That took me completely out of my element to these other kids, to these other environments, to a more affluent side of town, Mm. to uh, a more diverse side of town. I got to uh, see a lot of different people, a lot of different things all of a sudden, Mm -hmm. and then return back to my neighborhood at night. So I was still in that environment, but I got a little bit of visual um, difference during the day while I was in school. And I think that was, uh, that started the trend positive for me. And I followed on with going to AC Flora High School, which is, again, on the other side of town, same two-hour bus ride uh, to continue my mass, my, my Meg's education, um, but still return to the neighborhood. But I think as that kind of, I was getting in those different experiences, they were shaping me in a way that was making me um, resilient, maybe, to some of the circumstances that were having, happening in my neighborhood. Well, I also had the positive influence of Mama J, who was constantly like reinforcing, like you can go outside and play basketball and football with these kids, but you're not doing any other shenanigans. Like you got stuff to study for, do that, then go play, then come back inside because you got to wake up before 5 a.m. to catch this bus. So I, I think it started trending in a positive direction from there. How did you hear about West Point and what even inspired you to attend the academy? So another Mama J moment, right? She said, um, you are going to school at 18. You will get out of this house. <laughs> you will go to school, not an option. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know our circumstance, I can't pay for it. So you need to figure out how to pay for it. Chevy, Sean, my brother too, you all are smart enough to go out there and get a grant, a scholarship or something. So I, I was kind of peaked on this. Okay, I need to go to school, but I need to go for free. So here I am, a ninth grader, uh, four years removed from the conversation with Mr. Roberts, and in walks somebody who works in the admissions department from West Point, um, and a diversity officer. And she is a young graduate, um, another uh, a black woman, um, and is talking about the academy, which I had never heard of. And I don't know what all she said. But I do know she said two things. She said, this education, I believe, is worth about a quarter million dollars at the time. It's probably worth more now. Um, And it's free. I don't think I heard anything else. (laughs) And when the question and answer session came up, I was the guy who stuck my hand up. I was like, well, what do I owe back? And she was like, oh, you know, a five year service commitment. Um, but you don't have to pay a dime for your school. And it's, you know, she talked about some of the rankings of it in comparison to Ivy Leagues. And in ninth grade, again, going off of what Mr. Roberts said, I need to set my sights on five years. And how do I get there? I was like, I'm going to West Point. I'm going to do everything in high school to make it happen. Um, and yeah, that that started my uh, trajectory, my journey toward West Point. And, and luckily it happened. So how was everyone... I guess looking at you at the time, was anyone else trying to go to West Point too? Any of your family members like West Point? Oh, oh yeah. Deal. Yeah. N- no one had a clue what that was in my family. A lot of uh, non college graduates. Mm-hmm. Um, so no one had a clue what this was. And it was, you know, it's like that. Is that in West Virginia? They had didn't even know geographically where, where it was. Um, so I just started, you know, and this is back also before we had like internet in the house sure. and stuff. So it's like still like a mystery. Yeah. Trying to find out what this thing is and going to learn from books in the library and stuff about what West Point is. But I, I found out what it was. And my mom, Mama J was just simply like, OK, if that's what you want to do, I believe in you. You can do it. Um, and, you know, just going through the process of, OK, I think, you know, I need to be well rounded. So I need to play sports and I need to be involved and the teachers uh, pretty much got behind me. Um, one in particular, I was in ROTC at the time, and Tom Grimes, he was a uh, retired lieutenant colonel, Vietnam veteran, mm-hmm. and uh, retired Sergeant Major James Sanderson, also a Vietnam veteran, a Purple Heart recipient from Vietnam. Both started like, oh, this is what you want to do? And then saw I had the potential for it and really dove in. 
I come to find out when I did actually get into the academy that no one in my uh, high school history had gotten into Florida. So the school made a big deal about it because they were like, this is a $250,000 scholarship. And I was like, that's not really a scholarship, but I get what you're trying to say. Right. Um, but I did have one kind of negative moment in there where um, my mom stayed in touch with my aunt. My aunt worked, they worked at the same job, Quality Electronics. And she brought my aunt over to kind of maybe have a celebratory moment about getting into the academy. And my aunt was kind of like, she just wasn't really feeling it. And she said this phrase that stuck with me to this day. She said, um, West Point, we become nothing. You're not going to get through that. And I was really like taken aback by that. Like what? What does she mean by this? What she doesn't know is that's the wrong thing to tell me and my brother, especially in the context of what Mama J had pushed us to get out of. Like that was actually the exact negative motivation that I needed to not just prove like her wrong. This was about proving the world wrong. I'm supposed to be a statistic. And this was... Maybe not even her, but an embodiment of sometimes our society can push back and say, you can't do that. You're you're not of the right background. You're not in the right neighborhood. You know, you don't even come from the right family. Like that's for other people. Sometimes society tells us that. And that was a moment where I was like, thank you, society, because you just motivated me. So then I decided to go to prep school uh, just to make sure I was extra prepared. Because you are you you did mention that you did score very well on the SATs, yep. the ACTs. Yep. You could have went direct. I yeah. did. So I had a I had a direct appointment to start. Yeah. And I honestly got very nervous. Wow. Um, and was like, you know, the admissions officer came down, mm-hmm. um, from from here, and I was you know talking about different ways I could you know prepare and study and you know take more courses. And no one wants to take more courses in high school, mm-hmm. so. I was like, well, is there anything else I can do? And he started talking about uh, NIMI and the other kind of small preps. Um, but he mentioned the the actual prep school that at the time was in Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, said, hey, it's a year long program. I mean, it's geared toward, you know, you getting to, you know, do all the stuff that you would do at West Point. And I was like, where is that? And he's like, Red Bank, New Jersey. I was like, I've never lived in New Jersey. Um, and he let us think about it. He was like, look, you're already in the West Point. All I need to do is like basically go into my computer and switch you to an, uh, a prep school appointment. So if you want it, I'll give you 30 days. You think about it. So I talked to friends, family. Actually, my my wife currently was my girlfriend at the time. Wow. So I talked to her about this. This was 21 years ago. Um, and everybody told me, like, if you think that extra year really helped do that. So I opted and swapped to a prep school appointment. Is the best decision, one of the best decisions I've ever made because I was really immature and got in a lot of trouble at the prep school. Um, but I, it allowed me to grow up a little bit before I got here. So as we continue this, this journey, I guess, well, now we're at West Point. Once again, you're going to be exposed to a completely different demographic of folks, very, mm-hmm. very competitive mm-hmm. students. Um, how was your West Point experience? I always describe it as an experience, like just that it's an experience Um, and let people kind of figure that out for my facial expressions and stuff. Right. Um, I actually thought it was uh, challenging, but life altering. Right. Like I grew up in a neighborhood um, where the context was like, you don't snitch, you don't trust authority figures, you um, you care more about your piso than than anything else right your friends and camaraderie all that stuff um and then i come here and it's like do not lie cheat or steal nor tolerate those who do and yes you absolutely do snitch um so it was it was really uh, a a change uh, a shift and you know i didn't really grow up like really understanding the opportunity i had in america and um you know, really loving the flag and the country and all of that there. You know, I didn't have this robust background of military people in my family. So I didn't pay attention to any of that. I just saw the Academy as a, as a great institution. And I thought of myself as somewhat of a leader. 
And I thought this could help craft that, build that capacity. So I come here, it's very jarring, very changing. Um, and it, to this day, I believe it has a major impact on the adult that I am, the person that I am, the father that I am, the husband that I am. All of those components started, you know, through the grit of my childhood, but also were really like, uh, really meshed all together in the crucible that is West Point, the 47 month experience. So it was fantastic, which is why I wanted to come back as staff and faculty. Do you play any sports while you're here? I did. I was a boxer. You're a boxer. I was a boxer. All four years. No, um, I got recruited like okay. they always do with the plebes. Yeah. Like if you can punch somebody really well in plebe boxing, then um, they want you to come out to the boxing team. So I, I actually, at first, I dabbled with the the tennis team being a manager, and it was because I had a roommate that was really cool, JJ Sabia. He's like, you should come out and do this. So I helped out with them at first, and then the boxing team said, hey, can you come do this? And I had a guy in my company named Boyd Melson who was – it probably really well known. Everybody knows Boyd um, that was an upperclassman in C1 with me. And I was like, hey, come out and do this thing. And uh, yeah, I, I did boxing for a little bit. Shoulder injury. I um, didn't do it my first year at all. Um, but I still box to this day. Um, learned a lot in that, not only in that class, but on the team. Mm -hmm. uh, boxing was great. Super love great. It. And I didn't get like a messed up face or nose yeah. or anything from it. So Yeah. Still looking great. And so I guess after West Point, you commissioned as an ADA officer. I did. What led you to branch psychological operations? So um, I was on my first deployment. And, uh, you know, this is the time of the surge. Mm -hmm. I was uh, basically doing base defense, force protection, uh, something called counter rocket uh, artillery mortar. So within the lane of of ADA but not really it was a new concept at the time um and I felt like this was me kind of being pulled out of uh my specialty in a way but also doing something that was helpful right mm -hmm. um I felt like I was you know doing my part so here I am talking to Ashley who is a recurring great person for advice in my life here I am talking to her on the phone. And back then it was like wait in line for 30 minutes to sign up, to get a 15 minute phone call, you know, all of that stuff back in the day before we had Wi-Fi <laughs> and all that. Um, and I was talking to her about, hey, when we get back, um, I need to figure out whether I'm going to the captain's career course or not. And the decision point for that is, am I going to get out? Because if I'm going to get out, no point in going to the captain's career course. And she's like, well, if you were to get out, what would you do? And I said, well, I was a psychology major at West Point. I kind of really like people and understanding people. So I think I want to be a psychologist. She's like, well, what program would you go to? And I'm like, well, I think I've looked into UNC and it's, you know, some, you know, it's a great program. I'd have to get my master's on way to a PhD. It costs this much money. She's like, how are we going to pay for that? I was like, well, you do all the finances. So, you know, we can't really pay for it. And she was like, well, I, I kind of, I want you to, consider staying in hmm. um i saw you in rtc in high school i saw you go to prep school i saw you go to west point i saw you come into the army now i see you you know off in the war zone um this is all i've seen you do and you seem to be okay at it so is there a way you can do like psychology in the army and i had been at fort bragg and been introduced to the special operations community and knew about psyop um, i had a classmate who was actually an, an S1 in one of the battalions. Um, and I knew a little bit more about it than just kind of the internet stuff. And I was like, I think I have something in mind. And she was also like, well, I don't want to move all over the place. And at the time, SIOP only had one group and it was all at Fort Bragg active duty. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I think I really do have something in mind now because I can change over to this, do some psychology stuff, but also not move all over the world. So. That was the major pull at the time to to transition to PSYOP. Wow. That's a really difficult thing to say for a spouse. It's like, hey, I think you should stay in knowing that you're going to travel, you're going to deploy, mm -hmm. but she was supporting you all the way. She was and has always. Um, she's always been the person, like we joke all the time in my house that, you know, most people think I'm pretty driven, right? Focused and 
got a little bit of gumption or whatever it may be. What people don't realize, I may be an engine in a car, Chevy, right? I might be the engine. Ashley is the gas, the brake, and the clutch. She's always kind of maintaining the progression. She's always kind of determining um, our potential. She's also the steering wheel, right? Like, hey, you need to turn back this way or, hey, we need to take that detour and that that choice. Uh, she, you know, she's made a lot of decisions like that over time for us that helped me see something not only for our family, but in myself. Like even when I didn't believe I could, like she was like, hey, you need to go get a PhD. I was like, no, I'm not doing that. She was like, hey, they were like, hey, we want you to teach and be a tech. And she was the one that was like, I think you can do that. Like she's done that a, a bunch of times. And I've always said I, I, I really appreciate my mentors and people who have invested in me. No one has given me the advice that my wife has. She, she is spectacular, to say the least. I see why she's your better three quarters. That's right. That's how I describe her. She's not my better half. She's my better three quarters. I love it. <laughs> so you did say something that you were the first person to be a tactical officer at West Point mm -hmm. as well as instructor. Mm -hmm. How did that transpire and what was that experience yeah. like? So that was crazy. Um, D4, right? Yeah, D4, D4. was the was a company and I taught PL300. Oh, sorry, PL100 freshman psychology and uh, PL471, which was leadership and combat. <sighs> Craziness. Um so here I am, a Psy upper, team leader, um, wanting to um, do something different, transition. Um, and I thought, because I had two great tacks, I had Jeff Helms and Tom Gillerin, um, and both in C1. Um, and they, they, you know, a lot of investment in me, helped me make a lot of great decisions. And I wanted to be them for somebody else. And we wanted to get back to the academy to you know, be that for somebody else. So I thought at the time tax were the ones who got most, the most touch points with cadets. And I didn't really think, you know, I was like academic instructors have to focus so much on the material that I don't know if they get that like one-on-one, -on -one like I got. I remember uh, Tom Gillerin coming in the barracks at night, checking on study conditions. Hey, Chef, you want to get a break away from your studies real quick? Yeah. Go and play a little pool. I, to this day, I can beat him. Um, <laughs> Mm -hmm. that's a little dig at him, but he knows I love him. Uh, but he, you know, he just, we'd be playing pool, but he'd also be asking me, so what do you think about posting? And it was just a real subtle way of that development when not thinking it was happening, you know, taking care of me that way. And I wanted to do that for somebody else. So I came to be a TAC, went to Columbia, went through the Eisenhower Leader Development Program, came to TAC D4. But because I was a Psy Opera and because I was a BSNL alum, I was like, well, uh, I want to inject this psychology stuff somehow down there in the department. Like, you know, we talk about how PL100, PL300 help us. But here I had taken aspects of psychology and put it in the practice in, you know, in very difficult circumstances overseas in the Middle East. So I started asking, you know, friends in the classroom about, hey, can I you know, can we do some liaison maybe? And can I step in for a little, you know, little example? So I had a classmate, Bridget Bell, pull me in. I had a classmate, Jackie Jordan, say, hey, can you come, you know, illuminate this? Diane Ryan was senior in the department, and she actually pulled me over to talk to all the BSNL majors um, one night about, you know, how PSYOP is, you know, applicable to the department and the experience that I had. So I was really invested in the department, and it was because people were pulling me in. Mm -hmm. So my year group was also the first year we went back to uh, the army telling you when you're going to ILE. That happened while I was here. So we had um, a potential mass exodus of people who were getting their assignments curtailed and they were trying to direct hire people. And somebody in BSNL was like, let's hire from on, on post somewhere first. And I think that was the idea of Bernie Banks. And here comes Jackie Jordan, my classmate, my friend, who had put me into the classroom and says, those ELDP guys got the same degree that I have. She has a degree from Columbia and the same thing. She also said, well, I've seen Chevy in the classroom. Some of you have. Why don't we just ask Chevy? I think he can do it. And I, I believe uh, now General Retired Banks was like, yeah, let's try him out. And they asked the BTO if I could 
if I could do it. And I think I don't know the particular details, but I think at first people thought I was just going to straight shift over. And I think the USCC was like, no, he can like if he's going to do it, he's going to do both. Wow. And then um, at the time, PL 100 was run by Lieutenant Colonel Matt Clark. And uh, he said, I think I got a solution for it. And he pulled me over and he said, when do you want to teach? Which would be most convenient for you? Um, how can we facilitate so you can be on both sides? Um, do you want an office over here and over there? And, you know, they, very accommodating. Um, and so we we made it happen. And I, I taught um, and it was a phenomenal experience. But before I could, I went I remember going home and I was very busy as a tech, which all tech, you know, all techs are. Um, and uh, I come home and I'm like, hey, Ash. They asked me to teach and like like guest lecture. I'm like, no, they want me to like teach a whole course load. Uh, and she was like, how are you going to do that? And we started talking about the time. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, and she was like, well, do you want to do it? And I was like, I, I think I think I may, you know, want to dabble, want to try it out. And again, another piece of golden advice. She says, is this something we could potentially do in the future? Could you potentially get a PhD? Could you potentially come back to the academy at some point? I was like, yes to all of those. And she says, well, we need to try this out. So if you can do it, you can balance it out and they're being accommodating, go for it. So she ch- again, she pressed the gas instead of the brake in this instance and said, hey, go try it. And I tried it and it worked itself out. And now you're continuing a lot of the the research that you've done since you were you were here mm-hmm. now in your PhD program. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, I started out in the classroom here and got interested, really interested in uh, academia. i um, got really into deeper, a deeper interest into um, the science and the theory behind psychology and human development and how we react as leaders. Um, and then, you know, when it came to you know, figure out my PhD studies, this was kind of a natural fit. Like, well, I'm just going to keep charging down this line, but also in the context of trying to understand cadets, because there's a little joke that uh, all research is me search. (laughs) Right. So I'm trying to figure out my own experiences and how the academy changed me from that kid that was non-trusting of authority and don't, you know, don't snitch to the academy was like, no, you're now this person. Um, I'm just phenomenally interested in how the academy does that um, and how it, you know, builds the leaders that it does. So I I get the opportunity now to deep dive even further. Prior to this conversation, you told me something that really stuck with me, Mm -hmm. that you were the only black man in many of your professional circles, Mm -hmm. as well as having to prove your worthiness, but not too much while the bar is set forth by the onlooker. Yeah. What has this experience been like for you? And what sort of advice would you give young men and women who are in a similar position? That's a, that's a tough one. Um, so one thing I can never take off is my skin tone, right? I can hide my experiences, right? Those things we've talked about, about my childhood and stuff, I can, not be an open book, not share that stuff. But what I can't hide is my skin tone, my maleness. Um, I can never hide. So every time I walk into a room, that's what people first see, regardless of whether they know me or not. And that can be challenging, right? Especially if you grow up in the South, especially if you grow up in the circumstances that I did. You know, I've been pulled over for driving too slow. I've been pulled over for you don't look like you're from around here, right? Um, those things happen. So I've come to, you know, get myself in situations where um, there's not a lot of people that look like me, right? Like there was a time as a tech, I was the, I was the only African-American tech. You know, that's not by design. That's not the Academy's fault. It's, you know, just timing and people being here, right? You know, I got myself into a branch where, you know, there's extremely few people that look like me, especially if you add on the layer that I'm a West Pointer. 
I'm the only black man in my year group and my whole branch, for example. So that can make you think about being the only one, right? That can be like this timpani in the back of your head. Dum, 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 dum. You're the only one in here. And as a minority, every time you walk in a room, you can't help but count. It's this thing I can't turn off, right? You automatically, automatically kind of go around the room and, okay, there's two more people that look like me, or there's none, right? And when there's none a lot, that kind of pushes on you a little bit. But I kind of believe over time that while that matters, what's important is if you can be the go-to one. So that would be my advice to somebody struggling with that or in this same situation. And that can be, you can be the, you can be a lot of only ones, right? Like you can be the only Asian, you can be the only male, you can be the only female in the room, you can be the only combat engineer, you can be the only person in your functional area, you can be the only member of the LGBTQ community that is in your space. So you can be a lot of only ones. But I've always told people, and I've come to believe that while that matters, what really matters is if you can be the go-to one. So what I mean by that is, sure, people are going to also recognize that you're the only one. But if you can be the one that they can go to, you're reliable, you're competent, you're consistent, um, you're, you have a, a, you know emotional intelligence, you're a team builder, you want to connect with people even though they don't look like you, right? You want to build teams with people and do group stuff with people, even though they don't have your experience. Um, I think people care more about that than anything. Can you get the job done? Can you connect to others? Do you care more about others than that singular experience that you're having? I think that can be very powerful, right? And let's just be pretty frank if you're talking about like an army experience. None of my OERs say this is the best black officer that I've ever seen. They don't say that, right? They use very objective language about my performance and my potential. And a lot of that is, yes, their subjective experience of me, but it's also, can, am I doing the work? Do I have the potential? Have I done what I needed to do? I also am kind of countercultural on the idea of, you know, me as a black man, I got to work twice as hard. No, me as a professional, I have to work twice as hard because that's me, right? I would work twice as hard if I was purple. Um, that's just kind of how I think. And that's, I think, a lot too to the way Mama J raised me to go out there and get it. And don't let life circumstances kind of press on you recognize it acknowledge it let it hurt right remember it but don't let it stop you does that make sense that's great advice that, that's very great um you're so well put together you're, uh, you're, you're so you're so <laughs> humble thank you i appreciate that what what keeps you going what keeps you going during these tough and challenging times both in your childhood and even today. Wow. Um, surely it's, my, it's partly my faith, right? Like I believe in there's something else out there that is like the reason I say I'm an open book is because I don't think these are my stories, right? These stories were given to me to then pass along to somebody else. I was a conduit, right? So it's definitely some of my faith there. Um, a big piece of it is my family for sure. They, they have stayed my priority. You know, being with the same woman for 21 years, married for 13, um, has had some consistency in my life. And she is um, a phenomenal uh, better three quarters. So it's, it's her, the sustainment of her always being my champion, um, always being there for me, loving me, caring for me, um, setting me straight. She's done that a lot of times. Don't do that. Do this. That was messed up, right? Setting me straight. So that, um, and part of that family, a subcomponent obviously is my kids, right? I have a 10 year old London. I have a one year old, let you guess which one was the surprise, Lola. Looking to them, right? And knowing that, you know, it, it's definitely not about me, it's about that next generation. And rem remembering my childhood, 
making sure they don't have the same, right? So looking, just simply looking into their eyes is, is enough inspiration to make you really want to do something with your life, really get yourself together, especially when they're babies and can't communicate with you, but they can look at you and you can tell right there whether they believe in you or not and what you're doing. So that's a major component. I think maybe my last thing here is finding a purpose. So when I was a young 20 something, you know, charging out of here, trying to be the best lieutenant ever, um, I didn't really, I don't think I had a purpose. Um, I think I was passionate and fired up about a lot of different things and passion is different than purpose. So um, this gentleman wrote uh, this book called Ego is the Enemy. I don't know if you ever heard of it, it's by Ryan Holiday. In it, he distinguishes passion and purpose. He's saying passion is purpose without limits. So passion is like a fire, right? It's always described as fiery. But if you put a fire down on the ground, even if you like put sand around it, put all these other mitigating measures, once you light it, ember goes up, wind takes it, you can't control that. You don't know where that's going. Purpose, though, is very focused. Purpose is not a fire. It's a laser pointer. So I think over time I've come to find what my purpose is. I think I am purpose built to serve others. That's a phrase I've said since I was 32, 33-ish or so. Um, And I think having that purpose keeps me grounded and keeps me pushing and keeps me going because you probably don't know this, but I'm actually more introverted than extroverted, right? I like to, you know, read a book and be quiet. I don't watch a lot of TV. I might want key to myself. But life... Um, hasn't allowed me to be an introvert, right? Like has put me in positions where I need to help others. Um, So while, you know, talking and connecting and doing all the stuff that extroverts do very well drains me because I'm more introverted, my cup gets refilled every single morning because I wake up and going back to that faith piece, I pray about my day and let, let me be purposeful today. Very something I say every morning. I wake up next to my family, right? I, you know, I share those initial moments with my family. I don't look at my cell phone and stuff until well after eight. And I wake up at six every day, even though I'm a graduate student, even when I don't have school, right? (laughs) I wake up with them and I spend that direct time with them to get that, get me up and get me going. Mm -hmm. And then I get to fulfill my purpose, you know, all day long. And I don't have to be in the nonprofit realm to serve, serve my purpose. I'm purpose built to serve others. You know, being a good father is service to others because those are other people in my family. You know, being a good friend is serving my purpose. Um, reading and self, uh, self um, growth, self education, professional development allows me to then be a better uh, servant of others. So that's how I, I kind of keep sustained. And I'm 39, almost 40, and I, I think I look about 23. You do. You absolutely do. (laughs) I'm not too worn out from, you know, this, I think. So thanks for that question. What's your take on failure? Oh, this is great because me and my daughter talk about this. My oldest, London, talk about this all the time. Failure is the greatest thing that we've uh, that you can come across as a leader. I will I come to believe this so wholeheartedly. Um, You always think you're going to succeed. Absolutely think you're going to succeed. When you graduate from West Point, like from a plebe, you saw yourself throwing your hat in the air. You saw yourself in full dress dress over white. Mm -hmm. You know, you see yourself in that circumstance over and over. But if you're a turn back or you stumble along the way where it doesn't work out um, and you don't get there on the time that you you needed, you will sit down and like, well, how did I get here, right? That's what we do at failure. Success does not nothing but build up your own pedestal. You already knew you were going to get there. You already knew you were going to pass Ranger School. You already knew you were going to uh, get through that certification or that class. So you don't go back and realize, uh, reanalyze, well, what made me successful? You, none of us do that. It's just not natural. You just like take it in, you know, put it in the bag, you know, take it to the bank and say, hey, I, w- I, I won. I got this tab or this badge or whatever it may be. But if you misstep, we all do it. How did that happen? How did I get here? If you get punched in the face in boxing when you think you're a really good boxer, wait a minute, I need to really quickly analyze why I misstepped. So failure 
is extremely important. So to my daughter, we talk about that. Like she practices violin. If it's not, if the notes aren't tweaked just the way she wants them, she gets a little frustrated. We know that that's growth. Failure is a whetstone to any piece of steel. You get sharp off of failure. We, you know, success is cutting through a tomato with a knife, right? It's just like, oh yeah, knife's supposed to do that. But if you can't, well, wait, why does tomato not split in half, right? You reanalyze what's going on there. So failure to me is probably one of the most important things leaders can face, for sure. That leads us here to today. Mm-hmm. You're currently in your PhD program. Mm-hmm. You have about a year and a half left. Mm -hmm. What's next for you after? So the Army is going to help tell me that. Um, I'm looking at uh, Lieutenant Colonel promotion here very shortly. And with that comes the CSL, Centralized Selection List. Central Selection List. The thing that helps you command select list. (laughs) 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 Might have got that right on the back end. Um, And uh, BSNL is going to allow me to compete. Uh, so if I compete and I'm selected, I can command in 22, but I graduate in 21. Um, so they'll allow me to go back out in the army and try to invest in a formation, some soldiers one more time before I come back here in 2024. But if I'm not on the CSL, then I will come straight back here in 21 and teach uh, in BSNL. Um, I'd be happy to do either one because I think both are purposeful um, and both would be, um, I think, put me in a place to serve others. You know, all roads lead back to West Point. Um, but if the opportunity to command arises, I'd greatly take on that challenge um, to invest one more time out there in the operational army. I ask this question to every single guest that's on the show. Mm-hmm. What is your definition of success? And do you feel you've achieved it yet? Mm. Wow, wow, wow. Um, So um, I think success is fulfilling your purpose. I think I am in the process of fulfilling my purpose. And I think I really won't know whether I was successful um, until I'm at the very end of whatever this existence is going to be for me. And I'm lying there, maybe surrounded by friends and family. And it's about the end. And I finally say I can't do anymore. And I I believe I have met my purpose or not. Um, so I think I'm striving for success through my purpose at all times. Um And I'm always nervous about um, whether I'm doing it well enough or not. So when I was here as a as a uh, cadet, I had the privilege of being uh, an assistant on the brigade staff. And Grace Chung, classmate of mine, um, was the first captain. And I always saw Grace. Grace was always nervous. She was really I mean, really the first captain is always awesome and phenomenal. Uh, And if I remember right, she was the first Asian female first captain, which is a big deal. Right. And she was, you know, delegates, you know, the president, you know, secretary of state. You know, she was always interacting with these very important people, always nervous. Fast forward to that first deployment. We deployed at the same time. We're in the same place. She's a lieutenant. I'm a lieutenant. She's having these LT issues. Right. And I'm like, I finally come to ask her, like, Grace. You were the first cap. Like I've saw, I've seen you be so phenomenal, but like always nervous about. Like you're the most capable person I know in leadership, right? Mm-hmm. So why are you always nervous? And she talked about this idea of needed nervousness, which she further illuminated when I was attacked. I brought her back as a guest speaker to my cadets. She's now a dentist, a great family. Um, she has a great family. She's married to Andrew Chung, another classmate of ours, and. Uh, she talked about this needed ner- this concept of needed nervousness. She said, if you are ever comfortable, then you're probably failing, right? You're missing something that you're not seeing, right? Whether you're in, this is in your family or whether this is in your practice or whether it's in your leadership. Needed nervousness, that 
keeping that edge was always very important. I tell that story to relate it back to my idea of success and fulfilling my purpose. I'm always worried whether I'm fulfilling it or not. And there's a needed nervousness there. And it's not a really anxiety or anything like that. It's just a, a nervousness about, am I doing this right? Am I impacting in a good way? Am I connecting with the right folks? Am I inspiring somebody, right? Um, and that nervousness keeps me striving for what success is, which is fulfilling my purpose. Does that, hopefully that makes sense. What an incredible journey. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for allowing us to, you know, go through each part of it. Mm -hmm. Where can people learn more about you and what you're doing today? So I am, you, I'm an open book. You can find me on Facebook or LinkedIn, which is, uh, you know, I'm the only Chaveso cook on the planet, C-H-A-V-E-S-O. But you can also find my, um, my nonprofit website. It's militarymentors.org. Um, and you can find that platform on IG, Facebook, LinkedIn. Uh, we're also on Twitter. Um, and, you know, just I would love for people to connect with my whole team. Um, we're research based. We're backed by um, people who are in the science of mentorship as well. Um, so I would love to you. Uh, yeah, connect with me, but also like, you know, connect with um, our platform so we can help you build, build your, your leader capacity, your leadership capacity and how to um, stretch conversations around what this mentorship thing is, because that's a whole nother. We could probably do a whole nother podcast on mentorship alone. Um, but it's a it's a wonderful way to obviously serve others and fulfill my purpose. So find me in that nonprofit space as well. Um, and if you're ever in Boston, comes by Tufts, at least for the next year and a half. My last question for you, Chevy, is what books are you reading right now? Oh, wow. That's great. Um, so on my books, I have 30 books that I need to get through. Like <laughs> like yes. in this month? Okay. Yeah, just in general. <laughs> like I got books all over my house. Um, and my wife always jokes because when they come from Amazon, they come, you can tell they're a book, mm -hmm. right? And she's like, oh, what you got now? So I'm always you know, getting books and getting books. But right now on my book stand, right next to my bed, um, is Angela Duckworth's Grit. Um, a very famous book. Everybody knows it. Um, I've dabbled and read pieces of it and all that stuff, but I've never like systematically gone through it all. And Angela, um, um, she works at UPenn. Um, uh, we happen to be professional colleagues and I got gifted the book and she studies character too. people, you know, she's known for grit, but she studies character. So that's just helping me flesh out some of my ideas at Tufts. So I'm reading Angela Duckworth's Grit. Um, it also has a chapter on purpose. So back to that theme, right? Mm -hmm. And then right beneath it is Barack Obama's uh, Audacity of Hope. Um, and it's just, um, you know, I like those kind of stories from people. Uh, I read Condoleezza Rice's book, um, uh, one of her man, uh, memoirs earlier this year, um, Extraordinary Ordinary People, um, you know, Colin Powell's uh, My Part of the Journey or My American Journey, like those little kind of stories from very successful people. And as you notice, like those are all minorities for me, important to understand my own growth and my own development. Um, so those are the two that I'm reading right now, besides kind of dabbling in all kind of Nick of Mickey and ethics and stuff like that, which is also in the, you know, in the character development space. Well, that is it. Thank you so much, Chevy, Thanks, for being Tom. on the show. Thank you.